Um, I want to talk a bit about the, the title of this came from uh, some, some uh, work that Robert Darnton has done, uh, professor of history and university librarian at Harvard. Um, he's talked about four revolutions in the history of knowledge. So the invention of writing, which made it easier to record uh, human memory, the invention of the codex to make it actually easier to read, the invention of printing, which created a lot more ability to disseminate that information, and finally the invention of the internet and the World Wide Web. So if you buy his thesis, we're in the middle of a revolution that occurs in information only about every 500 to 1,000 years. Uh, it, is, it is what is driving what we do daily in libraries, I think. Um, it is driving librarianship, and it's also what makes it incredibly exciting, in my view, challenging but exciting to be a librarian today. Um, so one often hears that the revolution means that libraries are going away. And I suggest that people that think that actually choose to ignore the data. I've talked a bit about the University of Toronto uh, in, in terms of its description, but I'd also say, you know, there are more than 18,000 people that use just the Robarts Library at the University of Toronto in a, in a day, uh, 10,000 on an average day, 18,000 on a peak day. So that does not sound like something that's, that's actually going away. Um, we're adding some 150,000 volumes a year to our print collections and many, many terabytes of data. Uh, there are 25 to 30 million downloads of that data every year, but, but also 3 million volumes are actually checked out of the libraries. So I think that libraries have always been at the forefront of change, uh, and, and that's an example of sort of, of how we are meeting that revolution uh, today. So let me see. Yes, it worked. Uh, so I believe the hybrid library will be with us for a long time. I often talk about the hybrid library. By that I mean the combination of great print and other physical collections combined with digital collections and other information in digital form, both born digitally and digitized, and with great physical spaces and of course expert librarians and staff. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the, the dichotomy of the libraries at the U of T. Uh, this is an example of some of our great print collections, something that we've recently acquired. Uh, we continue to build collections in medieval studies uh, for, for scholars, for the use of scholars. But I also mentioned our data center, um, 300, 300 servers. Uh, and it's, it's always fascinating to me that these great print collections in the Fisher Library are within four floors, five floors of this state-of-the-art data center. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the trends, challenges, and opportunities in libraries. Make sure that's up there. Um, my friend Marshall Breeding, he's a librarian, he was at Vanderbilt University for many years and is now a consultant, uh, came up about five years ago with these, um, what he called trends in libraries. And, and a few years ago, I used these in a slide to really talk about what we were doing in libraries. What I would now say is that um, I think for, for many of us in libraries, these are actually the recent past and not what we're doing. Oops, so it's not there. Uh, let me stop just a second. Did I pull that out? I think I kicked the cord, which is down below my feet. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about Marshall's, even though you can't see them on the screen. Uh, um, Marshall came up with these as, as again, a, a, a way to define the trends in libraries that were going on about five years ago. And I think for many of us, these are the past now. These are things that we've been working on, and they still inform what we do on a daily basis. But I think in many ways, we're now moving well beyond Marshall's trends of the last five years uh, uh, into other areas. And I'm going to talk about those just a bit. It seems to me that actually um, that is an indication of the rapid change that really is going on in libraries um, and, and how far we're moving, how rapidly we're moving in libraries and in librarianship. So these are some of the things that I came up with that we're working on at the University of Toronto that I think are actually the trends of today and going forward in the next few years. So, so the, the uh, collection of big data, facilitating digital scholarship, embedding librarians not just in a physical place but across the, across the university, 
both physically and virtually across the university, creating great social spaces, which I'll talk a bit about. Um, at the University of Toronto, we're deeply involved in the, in the, in the MOOCs that are being, held, that are being offered there, um, and certainly the use of, of cloud storage technology and other technologies to enhance access and discovery. Um, uh, some of the, so one of the things I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about some of our roles. And the first of those is actually the preservation of the cultural and historical record. I already alluded to that briefly, um, but, but I think it's important. I think it's one of the most important things that one generation does for another is actually uh, to preserve the record of human achievement, of, of research, of knowledge, and pass it on from one generation to another. And I, I've often said I think our unborn great-great-grandchildren will judge us in part on our success or failure at preserving their past, which is, of course, our present. So the question is, will they have sufficient information coming out of a world where information has become powerful and ubiquitous, where Twitter feeds and, and other social media can, can generate actually or start revolutions, uh, but, but information that's also incredibly e ephemeral. So will they have what they need to understand their past, which is our present? Um, so collections, digital and print, are of course uh, critical to what we do. They have been for generations, uh, going again back 2,000 years. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about our collections in order to provide some context for, the, for our collection storage uh, facilities. Um, so, print does still matter in my view. Um, we, as I said, at the University of Toronto still collect significant amounts of print material. Um, a few years ago, when I first got here, about three years ago, actually a faculty member in religion came to me and she said that we weren't acquiring nearly enough material documenting Tibetan Buddhism uh, particularly material published in China, which was critical to her research and, and to, the edge, to, to the work of her graduate students. The only way to acquire that material is actually to send people to places like Chengdu uh, to acquire material that is, that is published in very small quantities and is certainly not available through the normal acquisition channels. So we actually engaged in a partnership with Columbia University. Essentially, we pay them to uh, use some of the expertise on their staff to help us acquire the material that this faculty member and her graduate students need. That's an example of where print actually does still matter. Uh, would she rather have that material digitally? I suspect she would. She's asked me about digitizing some of it, although it's in copyright, but she needs it for her research, and I consider it a part of our mission to collect that material. Um, I also think we in libraries have to think carefully about the value we add to research collections. Some of my colleagues sometimes apologize or say it is a failure um, to collect something that is only used once in 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, but if the great research libraries don't collect and preserve, and I'm going to talk about that preservation in a minute, that material, including within our area of studies and special collections, then how will it be accessible 100 years from now? Um, I actually don't think it is a failure that we collect material that is not immediately used but is gonna be used in the future. That really is what is core to the mission of research libraries, um, in my view. And consider how much poorer our understanding of the past would be without those medieval manuscript collections at the University of Toronto and the Fisher Library that you hold, I know, here at McGill. Um, I'm fond of saying, if the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Dunhuang Scrolls, are they somehow less important now because they weren't used for 1,000 or 2,000 years, but we're hidden away, and obviously the answer is that they are not. Um, so I don't mi minimize the need to acquire material to meet current needs. Um, I think that part of our, our it, it is important for us to actually serve today's scholars, but I would also argue tomorrow's scholars. Uh, so that means though that we do need to collect today to meet the needs of today's scholars, that it's essential actually, um, and certainly current use is an indicator of our success in that. But again, um, at the University of Toronto, we take very seriously um, our mission to also collect for future scholars. Um, I do think that area studies and special collections sometimes have a special challenge because by their nature, the use is relatively low. But I'm also fond of saying, so is the use actually, uh, relatively speaking, of a multi-million dollar laboratory in, bio in microbiology. And we certainly don't apologize for building great research uh, uh, laboratories to support the sciences and medicine. 
By the same token, I think we need to, we need to build great research laboratories and libraries to support humanities and social sciences scholarship. Um, and that means that we have to acquire the especially hard to obtain resources, uh, materials that document language, culture, history, politics, as we always have, and wherever possible uh, to digitize that material, to work on copyright law changes and other changes that allow us actually to, copy, to digitize some of that material. Um, we just sent our music bibliographer to Iran. Uh, it's very difficult to acquire a material out of Iran. Um, and we have a couple of faculty who are very interested in, in music from Iran, which really is beginning to document some of the changes that are going on in Iran uh, through music. And so we basically gave him $5,000 in cash uh, that he took to Iran, was able to acquire some really interesting and important material that got shipped back and will now be ava made available not just to scholars at the University of Toronto, but across North America. Um, let me talk briefly about the Fisher Library. Uh, it is a great space. Uh, some of you may have seen it. Um, many people call it a temple to books. Um, it is inspiring, uh, but it also houses uh, some really great collections that have enduring value that attract scholars from around the world. Uh, on the screen is the interior uh, and a few examples of the some 750,000 treasures that, that uh, are held inside the Fisher Library. Um, the only first folio uh, Shakespeare in, in Canada, uh, but also uh, we recently acquired, for example, the 6,000 volume collection of Marshall McLuhan, uh, heavily annotated. He had three copies of Finnegan's Wake that he had completely filled with marginalia. And as you read the marginalia, uh, his writings in the book, you can, tr you can trace and track the evolution of his theories, uh, many of his, uh, the, 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 the uh, statements that are attributed to him have their origins in that marginalia, and you can sort of see how he actually changed them. That's actually how he did his work. Um, and you know, one of the things we're looking at is, are there ways, though, to use technology, and I'll talk a little bit maybe about this more of this later, but to use technology to make it easier for scholars to actually use, tra track those annotations, collocate them, uh, analyze them. And we believe that there, that there probably are, and we hope to start a technology project that will allow, uh, actually allow us to develop some annotation tools that will allow scholars to use that marginalia in new and different ways. Um, whoops. So, somehow I went too far. There. Um, I also had a copy of, El of Wolf's Elegy, and I probably in Quebec shouldn't talk about General Wolf, but we recently acquired General James Wolf's lifetime uh, correspondence. Uh, which we also hope, which has never been seen by scholars actually. It's been in, in private hands since he died at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham in 1759, and we hope to actually very soon make that also available digitally uh, for scholars around the world to use. So, which is to say that print matters, but so does the digital. As I said, I think the scholar who's, for whom we're, we're collecting the Tibetan material, I know, because she's told me she would much rather have it, uh, in digital format, um, and one of the things we're therefore trying to do is, wherever possible, develop discovery tools, access tools, and to digitize collections to make them as accessible as possible um, and, and open to the world of scholarship, and to develop tools that help people actually use that material. So we recently had some conversations with some medievalists about building such tools Imagine the ability to look across hundreds of books of hours housed in churches and libraries and monasteries across Europe and North America to see the annotations of different scribes or the same scribe in different copies. And imagine being able to learn the original order of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales by unraveling digitally the bindings of some of the rarest manuscripts. Doing that in real time with scholars around the world, uh, sharing their work and collaborating across time zones using technology and digital images. That is the exciting frontier of knowledge and research that we call digital research, digital scholarship nowadays, and libraries are enabling that, I think, by, by joining the digitized artifact with new technology-based tools. Um, and at UTL, we're working very hard, and I know others are, Chris and I talked this morning about some work at Stanford. Uh, many other libraries are working hard to try to develop such tools to really enable new forms of digital scholarship. And I think one of the other areas that we have to pay a lot of attention to is how we 
uh, document the contemporary culture and history. So how do we make sure that the, and they actually many of them have been lost, but the social media that resulted in the Arab Spring two years ago remains so that scholars can analyze and study that material 10, 15, 100 years from now. Uh, we need to look at self-published material that is born digitally, uh, including blogs and other self-published works that are in many cases the only means in many countries of communicating ideas at present. Um, a couple of our librarians uh, have been involved in, in, in Toronto archiving some of that material, so they collected all of the Twitter feeds, uh, blogs, uh, other sort of ephemeral social media material that they could find documenting the mayoral race last November when we managed to get rid of our mayor, um, and, uh, and are, are now, have now archived that. We're working on some of the, the uh, copyright issues with that, because there are copyright issues. But even if we can't sort out those copyright issues in the near term, that material is now archived, will be preserved in the University of Toronto Libraries, and 40 years from now, people will be able to come back and actually look at what was really a, pretty, a very important mayoral race uh, in Toronto and Ontario and understand uh, more about that, that race. So, uh, we also have the challenge of preserving data uh, and supporting digital scholarship. One of my favorite sound bites, frankly, that works very well with a lot of, uh, to explain the situation to a lot of people is, uh, the University of Toronto, uh, the Fisher Library has a Memory of the World, UNESCO Memory of the World collection on the development of, uh, or the, the discovery of insulin uh, in the 1920s. Um, we have all the lab notebooks, the patient records, uh, wonderful letters, people from, come from all over the world to use that collection. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I often, and, and there was a Nobel Prize one for that, for that work. Um, I often say that the next Nobel Prize, which may be doing, be done, being done work, that may be do, being done collaboratively between scholars at the University of Toronto and McGill, I suspect that we will not have those scholars' data because it's been developed over the last 20 years and much of that data is simply being lost. I think that we in libraries have a real obligation to work with our faculty, not just on research data plans that, that meet the criteria and requirements of the funding agencies, but also plans that really do preserve important data so that it is available 50 or 100 years from now. Um, in Ontario, uh, we're we're doing several things around that, but one is the development of what we've called the Ontario Library Research Cloud. It's a distributed net, uh, storage network um, which will allow us to replicate uh, important material that needs to be preserved at various universities across Ontario uh, in order to ensure the preservation of that material. And we're developing something called the Canadian Text Archive Center at the University of Toronto Libraries. Uh, which will bring together, we hope, many, many, many terabytes of text data. There's already about a, a petabyte of text data there uh, to make that material available for digital scholarship for not just U of T and Ontario scholars, but also for scholars from across Canada. Um, and it really is an effort to provide uh, cost-effective, scalable storage within Ontario uh, to preserve that data while making it available for digital scholarship. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about then the challenges of preserving these print collections. Um, um, one of the things that we've done, uh, I, I said I think earlier there are about 12 million volumes and 30,000 linear meters of archives at the University of Toronto, uh, but there are many more millions of volumes in the university libraries across Ontario. So we have created a project called the Downsview 5 Preservation Project. Um, it's University of Toronto, Queens, Western, McMaster, uh, and Ottawa. So it's, it's, it's the research libraries in the GTA plus Ottawa uh, to help ensure that we preserve these collections for the future. Um, this is actually, and I'm not going to read it, but this is a sort of elevator speech that my colleague at Queens, University Librarian at Queens, Martha Whitehead, created. Um, the key words in it are long-term sustainability of low use and important research material. So doing that collaboratively and in partnership with each other uh, in a storage facility that was constructed about now 10 years ago by the University of Toronto at Downsview, this is the original facility on the screen. Um, 
Academic libraries are striving to achieve the optimal mix of collections, spaces, and services that will best position them for the future. Um, we, we in all of our libraries in Ontario have developed significant national collections, but we all feel the competing space need and uh, pressures for collection and space, for, for space for students and space for collections. So we decided to meet this challenge by expanding this facility from its current two million volume capacity, which is actually full, it's actually over capacity at about two and a quarter million volumes. Uh, we're gonna add three million volumes to it, so it'll be five million volume capacity. There's actually land to add another 10 million volume capacity, so it could go up to 15 million volumes. Um, it uses efficient high density storage, we will remove duplicated items from across our collection, so there will only be one copy of an item in that facility that we will collectively preserve. Um, we're gonna use existing university transit services and delivery networks to deliver material as it's needed back to the campuses. Um, and we'll also use technology to deliver material to the desktop where we are able to. Um, the, most heavily accessed, the most heavily used materials will remain in the libraries in close proximity to the user communities with other material being transferred from across the five institutions into this facility. Uh, and as I said, it will be, there will be no duplication. So only one copy that the five of us will then help support um, and use. Um, we will make all of the low demand collections there discoverable. Uh, so that they can be requested through each participating library's catalog, and we'll use technology to help facilitate browsing of those collections, at least virtually, um, and the need to use some of the material for quick reference or fact checking uh, by using, again, desktop delivery uh, under fair dealing of some material uh, that is needed by faculty and graduate students. All the material will be returned to the institutions for long-term use for dissertations and research projects, and actually there's also a reading room on site and finally, we've actually digitized all of the out-of-copyright materials, so about 450,000 monographs that are stored there to be preserved are already digitized, um, and many of the journal collections are digitized as well. Uh, if you've not seen one of these facilities, uh, this is uh, a picture of some of the stack areas. They're 36 feet high. Uh, the environmental conditions are, are what is required to preserve print in, for, for long periods of time. So 40% relative humidity, 63 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, ideal for the preservation of paper. Um, it really is a fascinating place to visit. Uh, that's a picture of some of the collections actually sitting on the shelves uh, and actually uh, another view of the shelves. We would have preferred to have had uh, at Toronto uh, uh, an ARS facility, so an automated retrieval and storage system uh, associated with Robarts Library, but there simply is not the land uh, and, and there, there are several other reasons uh, that, are, that are largely technical and design reasons that there simply is no place to put such a facility on the campus at the University of Toronto, unlike the University of Chicago, which, is, which has added such a facility to its main library, and it's, it's uh, been well received by their faculty and graduate students. So in some ways, this became a compromise for us, um, but also one that we can share with the other institutions in Ontario. Uh, and that's uh, actually the cherry picker and one of the staff people there who uh, retrieve materials and again, uh, same or next day delivery back to the institutions. Um, but we also actually have some other serious preservation issues uh, that that facility doesn't take care of at the University of Toronto, including you know, vast audiovisual collections. We have the Lionsgate archives. We have all of the Degrassi archives for the Degrassi television series. We estimated recently there's about a 2,000 year preservation problem with that material and most of it has a lifespan of about 25 years. Uh, we're not sure what we're gonna do about that. I would welcome suggestions. Part of the, this material is actually housed in about a quarter square block uh, refrigerator. Uh, for those of you who know Toronto at the corner of Bloor and St. George Streets, uh, most people don't actually know it's there. The problem with the refrigerator is it has to be replaced every 10, 15 years that's fine when it's in your kitchen. When it's a quarter square block, it is a very expensive refrigerator to, to replace. But in fact, the cold storage is helping to preserve those collections. Um, so let me end up by just talking a bit about the challenge of meeting the need for, for, for study space. Um, uh, we've, we, have, we have given a high priority, my predecessor did, and I have at the University of Toronto, 
to providing signature study space for study, research, and learning, a uh, space that is a destination for our students. And I think the 18,000 people that use Robarts on a heavy day, I didn't say, but in the science library, it's about 10,000 people on a heavy day, an average of around 6,000 on, on a regular day, uh, are testament to how successful that's been. Um, but one of the things I sometimes hear is, well, students don't use libraries uh, the way they used to. They now just use them for study. That's actually not true that they just use them for study. But my point is actually that students have always actually used libraries for study um, as a place to come to, to work together. So this picture is from the University of North Carolina uh, in 1947, students studying, much like students study today. Or from 1977 at UNC, students doing group work in the undergraduate library there, just like they do today, except the hairstyles are a bit different. Um, my predecessor, Carol Moore, had started a long-term plan to revitalize the library spaces at the University of Toronto. And it began really in 2005 when there was a major addition to the Science Library uh, called the Morrison Pavilion, which, which provided uh, inspiring spaces for, for quiet study, for group study, uh, and for new kinds of uses, both in the Morrison Pavilion and then that it was expanded to the Robarts Library. Um, what I would say is, and, and the pictures I have of the Morrison Pavilion uh, don't show students in them because they were done for, uh, for some architectural purposes, uh, but every seat is usually taken in that facility and often it is so quiet that you can hear a pin drop. I have taken visitors through some of the study spaces and I can tell you, I get shushed by the students who are there and they glare at me. Um, some of the most irate students, complaints I've had from students have been, there's a beautiful reading room in that facility that was, open, that was constructed in 1910 and restored. And a few times we've used it for university-wide events. And I always hear from students when we do that. The president always hears from students when we do that uh, because they see it as their space and, and they do not want the university using it um, as one of the students said for, to me, use some other space to raise money. You don't have to use our space to raise money. Uh, these are just some of the spaces, again, these were for, taken for architectural purposes and don't have students in them, but I can assure you they are always, these, these chairs are always full. Um, and that's actually the exterior view of the Morrison Pavilion, which is the back of the main science and medical library at the University of Toronto. Uh, following the Morrison Pavilion construction, uh, there began to be a massive renovation and revitalization of Robarts Library. Robarts, the Robarts complex is about a million square feet and much of the space has now been, been essentially, uh, to use the term of my predecessor, revitalized uh, with new kinds of spaces having been created. Um, but this is really space, again, that, that students use that, that gets them away from the distractions of residents and campus life, um, spaces that they greatly, greatly value um, and that they heavily use. So, so this is uh, typical, some of the typical kinds of new spaces. Uh, these are study spaces where students can bring technology with lots of uh, robust wireless and, and lots of electric plugs and all of that. Um, other kinds of computer labs. Uh, there are lots of computer labs that are heavily used still in that facility. Um, additional computer labs. Uh, this is in our data center. So the data center, the map and data center was, was completely gutted and rebuilt to allow students to have space to work with some of our experts in statistics and GIS um, and in the use of data. Um, again, one of the complaints I get is that we don't have enough staff actually to meet the needs of those students. So we don't have enough librarians, data specialists, and statisticians in this facility to actually meet the demand of the students and the faculty. Uh, but there's also just lots of quiet study that goes on and hidden nooks in the stacks uh, that we've tried to put as mu much of the seating as possible near the windows uh, so that students, I don't know if that, you can actually see that view, yeah you can, so that students actually get the benefit of many of the great views uh, from the top floors of Robarts Library while they're also studying. Um, and Finally, lots of group study rooms. Part of the problem is we, there simply is not enough space to provide the amount of group study that students need. Um, what I haven't shown in these pictures is actually though the, some of the other spaces. So there is a raucous uh, food court 
the busiest Starbucks, I am told, in Toronto, inside of Robarts Library. Uh, students also love those spaces. And the lines actually are so long in, in, the, in the Starbucks that one of the complaints I get is, why can't you do something about the lines at Starbucks? Um, uh, there's a 60-seat theater that's in constant use. Uh, I mentioned the spaces we've created for media and data use. Um, and, and of course, many quiet, solitary spaces throughout the building. But it's not enough. And so we now have plans to build a, about a 60,000 square foot addition to Robarts Library. This is a photograph, of, this is an artist rendering of the addition. Um, uh, it is gonna be a space that is full of light, full of the newest technologies, uh, lots of comfortable seating to support all kinds of work that students need to do. Um, and when it's completed, Robarts, this facility and the science library will have about 6,000 study spaces, which frankly is still not going to be enough. But they will at least be study spaces with brand new state-of-the-art collaborative learning spaces and lots of quiet study spaces. Um, we think it is a critical investment in students to ensure that they graduate positioned uh, for success in the modern information economy. Um, and this building is really the capstone of of the, uh, the vision of my predecessor begun more than 10 years ago to revitalize the libraries at the University of Toronto. Um, I'll just show you a few of the renderings. Uh, this is the, the main entrance, which will also have a plaza in front of it that in the very short summers in Canada, students can sit outside. Um, uh, this is the main entryway, and the stair riser system is gonna be used to sort of create an atrium with platform seating which for those of you who have seen uh, the DH, the Hunt Library at North Carolina State University, uh, they've done something similar. It's incredibly popular with students. Um, the second floor, the, using their stair riser system again for both the platform seating, but also some tiered fixed seating. Uh, we've used that kind of seating uh, in, uh, it's, it's over there. We've used that kind of seating in Robarts Library in places, and again, it's incredibly popular with students. Um, the top of that sort of atrium, looking out, the views to the south. Um, my colleague, who's the Dean of Arts and Sciences at, at Toronto, sees this as really the sort of, the, those buildings you see are the Arts and Sciences complex. And so for the Arts and Sciences, the College of Arts and Sciences, this becomes the sort of end point of their campus, as it were, uh, and a space that is really, it's not dedicated to, but will serve the many, many undergraduates in Arts and Sciences at the University of Toronto on its St. George campus but also lots of, of traditional study spaces, actually, because students really want that kind of space. Um, and in our focus groups and work with students, we've been told to provide plenty of that kind of space. Again, lots of quiet study space, which students very much want. Um, and this is finally a rendering of just the whole complex with the Fisher Library, with the little uh, peacock head, as people call it, um, and, the, and the new commons on the side. Um, but it will also provide us with some space to create uh, teaching and visualization labs. These are not at the University of Toronto, but at North Carolina State University, but new kinds of spaces that students are also demanding. We have opened some of those spaces at the University of Toronto libraries and our science library. So there's something called the Mad Lab, um, which is a student-centric facility devoted to mobile software development. Uh, but we've also installed our 3D printing services there which are incredibly popular again. We can't actually meet the demand now for 3D printing from the students. <clears throat> um, I had another section on the way forward uh, talking about collaboration, but I'm gonna actually skip over all this. Uh, so I'll just skip over to the end and say, you know, I think the future of libraries remains. So great physical spaces and great virtual spaces uh, with great, great collections, electronic and digital, uh, and by collections I mean more than just print and more than just actually uh, the, the sort of traditional print that has now been converted to text, but also social media and all kinds of information that we need to preserve in libraries uh, to collect the record of human history and discovery and to make it accessible and discoverable. So, thank you. Larry will take questions, and um, I just have 
One quick thing to say that, um, with apologies to my colleagues, I forgot to introduce Larry. So, but they have such interesting things to say. What I am going to suggest to people is that their bios are on the back of the program. Just read those. They're all incredibly interesting people. Uh, so, questions for Larry. Please go to the microphones. I have a question. Oops. To your left. <laughs> Yeah, um, so Faculty of Medicine, we want to know, are your servers, can you confirm that the servers are in Canada? Say that again. Are your servers, you, you have 300 servers, are your servers in Canada? Oh yes, they're in Robarts Library. Yeah. That data center that I showed you is on the seventh floor of Robarts Library. Perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know, part of the issue with the Canadian Text Archive Center is we hope to bring, and I'm not going to say which ones, but some of the major text repositories housed in the U.S into that server room and then duplicated in some of the cloud service services that will be spread across Ontario in order to make sure that research can actually be done in Canada. Thank you very much uh, for a fascinating talk. Chris Lyons, Osler Library, History of Medicine. Um, as a rare books librarian, I was encouraged by your emphasis on preserving the physical record and the importance of preserving the physical record, because it's something we, we take very seriously here at McGill as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about the idea of a national <coughs> strategy for preservation, in particular of Canadian material, because over the past few years, at least from my worms uh, level perspective, it seems like the National Library, Library of Archives Canada, has sort of abrogated its role as a you know, primary conserver of Canadiana, Canadiana material, and to the point where they've been offering collections to other repositories, um, in sort of, they're imploding, in fact. Which leads me, uh, as an individual, but then collectively, uh, not only as a rare books librarian, but as a, a Canadian, to be concerned about the idea of preserving our record. And what I'm wondering is, have there been any national discussions amongst the major libraries um, to develop some sort of joint policy towards preserving Canadiana, given that, as your Downsview example is, we can't all keep everything. And if there hasn't been discussions along those lines, do you see the need or the potential to start those discussions? So, so I think there have been a few discussions, but I, don't, I think that we need to do a lot more. I think we need to figure out how, at least among, say, the U15, institutions we can collaborate more we can't you know we university of toronto can't we can collect the mayor race but we can't collect everything even in canada um so i, I there have been there have been discussions but i think that we need to actually do more discussions and 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 probably there's been a lot of collaboration inside of ontario because of the scholars portal and mm -hmm. ontario council of university libraries but i think uh, we need to expand that both in print so in preserving print and particularly in how we, we preserve the Born Digital um, across Canada. I, I actually would say as well, though, I am a great admirer of Guy Bartillon, and I think that he is really transforming LAC in very positive ways. So this is, this is being publicized, isn't it? Um, <laughs> well, I'll say, well, so, so I can't really say this too <laughs> too much detail, but, but he has, he has approached after. us about, about actually looking at some of our collections jointly, and it is likely that we, for example, are going to put together a joint uh, project with, with LAC to try to have one of our other collections that are actually held in both places um, uh, designated as a Memory of the World collection. That includes, because of the requirements there, for all kinds of access and discovery tools and making sure that the collections are both preserved and collected. And he's very eager to engage in those kinds of partnerships. They've resumed actually collecting at, the universe, at, at LAC. Um, and, and so I think that the things there are also changing. And he's very committed, at least he has told me, he's very committed actually to working much more closely with us in a very positive way to both make sure we're preserving Canadian, Canadian history and culture um, and also making it accessible and discoverable. Great. Thank you. 
there is somebody right. there. So um, you talked earlier about uh, the big investment in electronic resources that your library is making, and that were, of course, similar. Um, when we talk to our faculty about electronic resources, especially in the humanities, we hear from some faculty that they find e-books less usable than print books. And uh, one, I wonder if you can say a few words about what we in libraries are doing and what our publishers are doing to fix that, to make them more usable. Things like getting over the platforms where you can only read them online in their browser, et cetera. Yeah, so I'm going to actually suggest that you ask Cliff that question because he knows a lot more about it than I do. Um, what I would say, so I'm going to duck that question and let him answer it, but what I would say is that I met with our humanities chairs uh, last week, actually, <coughs> to, <coughs> excuse me, to talk about um, our preservation facility at Downsview because much of the material there is actually, uh, well, the science material there has been, you know, it's the journal literature, it's been digitized and we're preserving it, um, but it's, it's not gonna be heavily used. Uh, many of the humanities collections there, though, it's quite different. They're needed for dissertations, they're needed for research, and there's a serendipitous sort of discovery through browsing. Um, they were actually very eager, though, to talk to me, not about bringing all that material back uh, to campus, but how we could use technology to actually facilitate browsing and discovery and access. And, you know, things like digitizing that we can do under fair dealing, the, the uh, title pages and first chapters or tables of contents or indexes, um, maybe not all of that because that might be a copyright issue, but at least parts of that that we could do under fair dealing. Um, we have a browsing, a virtual browsing tool built into our online catalog, but it's it's got some problems right now, and they were eager for us to get those problems fixed because they actually use it, it turns out. So they were, you know, they were actually very eager to, use, to figure out how to use the technology. Um, and I you know, talked to them about, as I did here, you know, some of the tool development we want to do that Stanford has been doing, Johns Hopkins has been doing, others, uh, to facilitate you know, the use of medieval manuscripts and other kinds of material like that. And again, they're very excited about that kind of um, those kinds of initiatives when I think we talk about the possibilities that the technology enables rather than talking about just having the material in storage. So, you know, I was actually, I, I went there thinking, you know, I'm going to come out from this sort of bloodied, and I came out from it, they were very, very positive about all of those, those kinds of ideas. Uh, Peter McNally, History of McGill Project. I'm also interested in your um, discussion about the repository and, uh, the, um, and, and the various libraries, universities involved with it. And I think I heard you say something that, to the effect that um, if there were multiple copies, uh, choosing one and not keeping the others. But um, I, I would, from my own research, and it's an area where I have done research, it's often very important on occasion uh, to be able to reconstruct struck, for instance, um, the, um, the contributions of particular donors. So, for instance, the fact that um, you might have um, a particular benefactor who has given a great many books and wanting to be able to reassemble them. Or, for instance, you might have uh, copies which have important annotations in them or perhaps tipped in material. So, I'm just wondering to what extent these types of, um, of considerations would go into deciding what to keep and what not in such a repository. So the, the selectors, the, the, the collection experts make those decisions. They, they, you know, one of the criteria obviously is use, so those facilities don't work if you put material in them that are needed to support undergraduate curriculums or first year graduate curriculums. They, they, so, so, so the selectors look at it and I think they do take into consideration those kinds of of point. So we would not, for example, um, if we have collections that were given by donor, many of those collections are probably actually for us in the Fisher Library in any case um, and are not in the general collections and we're talking here about general collections. Um, but, but in many cases, I mean, in, in many of those cases we probably wouldn't put those, those materials into Downsview or if we did we would actually duplicate them. So there's not a rule that you can't have a duplicate copy uh, the idea is that where it makes sense, we will only keep one copy. Uh, where it makes sense to have multiple copies, we'll keep multiple copies. It's, it's, again, it's not, though, a sort of ironclad, no duplication ever policy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Larry. That was hugely, hugely interesting.